Welcome back, everyone. Very pleased to announce the beginning of our third and final session. And I'd like to welcome our first student graduate, uh, graduate student faculty pairing, Yi Xing Li and Ku Yi Shen. Oh, first of all, thanks uh, uh, the Gaty Research Institute, especially uh, Rebecca and Chelsea, and this will give us a good chance to uh, see the, our graduate students' achievement and also a good gathering here. Uh, now I introduce my uh, student, uh, Yi Ching Li. Yi Ching Li is the third year PhD student at the, uh, UCSD. And uh, prior to joining our program, she uh, lived and worked in Lyon, Paris for several years, and then uh, got his, her master's degree from uh, the School of Art Institute of Chicago. And now uh, her, actually over there, she studied European, uh, the modern and the contemporary art over there. Now uh, in our program, she uh, turned her interest into the modern uh, Chinese art. And uh, she's in the stage of the very early kind of the, a stage forming her dissertation topic on the modern Chinese painting uh, in the 1920s and 1930s. So this uh, presentation actually is a part of the, her research project. Okay, now uh, let's welcome Yi Qing. Thank you for the introduction, Professor Shen. And I also want to um, uh, thank the Getty Research Institute for organizing this wonderful symposium. For me, this is a great learning uh, experience. And I thank all of you for staying here for the final panel. Um, this presentation uh, concentrates on the Chinese modernist painting um, in the early 20th century. I would like to start with an article published in the New York Times in 1929. In this article, a German writer described his first impression of Chinese painting when visiting an, ex an uh, art exhibition in China. As he said, quote, the first impression we receive on the ground floor is about the same as that obtained when visiting a European art exhibit. And this impression becomes stronger when we come to the real paintings. Indeed, we ask ourselves, in surprise, if perhaps by mistake we have entered an exhibition of modern French painting." Quote. This description correctly indicated Chinese artists' mastery of the techniques, the techniques of French modern painting. Since the beginning of the 20th century, artists in Shanghai established a number of art societies to practice and promote Western modern arts. So there were at least 10 more societies, and here I just list, um, list major ones. And among them, I focus on the Art Movement Society. It was established in 1928. Its founders, including Lin Fengmian, Lin Wenzheng, and Wu Dayu, and among others, are the first generation of artists who went to France to study modern arts. And the most popular newspaper, Shenbao, reported their activities in France. Through contextualizing the formation of this society, I intend to address two issues. First, why Chinese artists choose modernist painting as their artistic pursuits, despite the fact that this kind of painting was formally and conceptually unacceptable to most of Chinese audience. Second, how did these artists try to legitimize French modern painting in the socio-political reality of China? As early as 1910s, Lin Fengmian and Lin Wenzheng participated in the study work program sponsored by the Minister of Education, Cai Yuanpei. And Cai went to France in 1913, where he organized the Sino-French Educational Association. The study work programs supported Chinese artists to study in France with aims of, quote, expanding citizens' education, importing world culture, developing Confucian philosophy, and advancing national economy, quote. In the same period, the new cultural movement advocated for learning Western science and democracy as a way of liberating China from the old feudalist society. And the 1919 Main Fourth Movement 
reinforced people's awareness of national crisis and pushed forward movements of anti-feudalism and anti-imperialism. In Shanghai, the number of student participants in the Main Fourth Movement increased from 3,000 on May 6th to 20,000 on May 26th in 1919. And in the field of art, in 1917, Cai Yuanpei delivered a speech of replacing religion with aesthetic education. He defined the role of art in society as he explained, quote, art can cultivate people's sentiments of sympathy, elicit their pursuits for truth and beauty, and harmonize interpersonal relationship, quote. In 1919, the journal New Youth published Chen Duxiu's essay, Art Revolution, in which Chen criticized the conventional method of studying painting that is based on imitating the old master's works. These waves of movements in politics, culture, and art affected the young generation of artists to criticize traditional culture and to engage the art in the reformation of society. For example, one of the members, Wu Dayu, he worked in the Shenbao, the newspaper Shenbao, before his departure for France. And uh, he created a number of cartoon pictures that reflect his new thoughts that corresponds to the social movements. For example, in this um, picture, the train is a symbol of new culture, and these two figures wearing the old costume were, uh, are symbols of old culture, which was um, described as Chinese, uh, in Chinese character as obstacles of social progression. And this train is, is coming over and is about to crash down the old culture. And the high waves of uh, uh, refer to the three major political movements in China. The first one is 100 re Reform, and the second is Revolution of 1911, and the, sum uh, the summit of the waves are the main fourth movement in 1919. Uh, through this picture, the artist criticized the selfness of people um, who consider the individual happiness more important than the happiness of the whole society. As we can see from this one, the young man with sportswear using the scientific method here to defeat, <laughs> to defeat the old culture embodied in the, in the old costume. And this is very interesting. The artist placed the, the art above the economy and, edu and education, trying to improve the social status of art. It is against this backdrop that these young artists were motivated to study art in group. As this artist Wu said, inspired by the new cultural movement, I decided to go to Europe and learn, and learn Western art experience. Quote. In France, they studied techniques of painting at Ecole de Beaux-Arts in Paris. This is a group portrait of these artists and their faculties at the school. But, they did not limit their studies to academic painting. As an info man recalled, they often visited the exhibitions at private galleries and museums where they became familiar with paintings of Picasso, Matisse, and other modern artists. In particular, they practiced modernist painting at the Academy of the Grand Schaffmeyer. And this academy is a private art school. It aimed to prov provide art instruction differently from the Ecole de Beaux-Arts. And the founders of Martha Stella, Alice Dingenberg, and Lucy Simon attached importance to the post-impressionist style. Compared to the academic painting, like this one, was created by one faculty, um, Besnard, at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts. The distorted figure, bold colors, and abstract strokes were certainly more attractive to these artists. As Wu recalled, Quote, the Ecole de, Bo de Beaux-Arts sticks to impressionist style. I admire Picasso and Matisse because they keep creating new things instead of resting art on the levels they already achieved. Quote. In 1924, these artists established the, the Phoebus Society with an intention of unifying Chinese artists in France to practice and promote Western modern arts. It should be noted that 
their desire for the new East styles of painting also came from a sentiment of anxiety. It is a mixed feeling of a fear that Chinese art would lag behind the Western art, and an eagerness to reposition China in the map of world culture. This can be seen in the FIBA Society's manifesto, quote, concentrating on creating Western art through earnest studies in studios and make best efforts on the China-West communication, quote. For this nationalist interest, this society organized the Chinese art exhibition in 1924 at the Ballet du, uh, du Ren of Strasbourg. It was the first exhibition showing China's most advanced artworks in the West Europe. This exhibition included Lin Feng Mian's 14 oil paintings and 28 color ink paintings and a number of oil paintings and sculptures by other members, unfortunately, all of these works were destroyed in the wartime, so um, we can't see it today. And Cai Yuanpei sponsored this exhibition and wrote a ca uh, forward to the catalog. Quote, the great talents exhibited here are not mere imitators of the Europeans. They are capable of producing works with a purely Chinese style as well as experimental works that integrate European and Chinese stylistic elements. Quote, one year after, this group cooperated with the Art Work Society of China to organize Chinese exhibition for the 1925 Paris International Exhibition of Modern Decorative and Industrial Life. So this is the posters of Chinese gallery and exhibition. And Lin Feng Mian wrote catalogs to this show, and Lin Wenzheng and Liu Jipiao managed, managed the construction of the Chinese gallery, and Wu Dayu arranged specific works for this exhibition. Under the support of Cai Yuanpei, Lin, Lin Feng Mian came back to China in 1926. And in 1928, Cai Yuanpei invited him to be the first president of Hangzhou National Art Academy. This academy aimed to Quote, introducing West art, reforming Chinese art, reconciling Chinese and Western art, and creating contemporary Chinese art. Quote, by 1928, the major members of the Phoebus group in the Paris came back to Shanghai and became the key faculty members of this academy. Lin Feng Mian is the president of this uh, Hangzhou National Art Academy. And Lin Wenzheng is the dean. Wu Dayu is the director of Western Painting Department. Cai Weilian and Feng Ganmin were the faculty of this department. And Li Jinfa is the director of Sculpture Department. And Liu Jipiao is the director of Design de Department. And Wang Daizhi is a representative in charge of the cooperation with the Europe. And this is the uh, classrooms and the libraries that they built in the academy. To continue to promote Western modern arts, they established the Art Movement Society in August 1928. This new society requires each member to submit a certain number of uh, paintings and articles monthly. As, he, as the member Li, Yuan, Li Pu Yuan noted, quite often the members submitted works more than they were required. Their works were published in several pictori pictorials and art journals. At the same time, they published art magazines and books to introduce Western arts and the theories to students. Under their influence, French modern painting became the major interest of most students in this academy. As their student Wu Guanzhong recalled, quote, teachers and the students were obsessed with Western modern arts. Students run to borrow the catalogs of Monet, Cezanne, uh, Van Gogh, Gauguin, Matisse, and Picasso. These artists were unknown to most Chinese people, yet they found their home in the Avery Tower by the West Lake, and West Lake is the location of this academy. However, underneath this blooming surface, it lies some obstacles that thwart the, de the, the development of this society. First, the feudalist ideology is still persistent in China. For example, after a 10-year debate on the issue of using nude model, nude painting was still hardly accepted. Uh, 
By 1927, Beijing National Art Academy's news painting were condemned as a threat of social morality. Second, the, the public audience did not appreciate arts. As Lin Fengmian observed, quote, artists cannot create art for the sake of art because we don't have the freedom to express ourselves, nor can we create art for the sake of people's life because Chinese people is not interested in art at all, quote. Third, Japanese invasions aggravated the national crisis. The 1937 Sino-Japanese War eventually interrupted all activities of art. If this group experimented with modernist painting freely and peacefully in Paris, then in 1930s China, they need to reconsider the role of modernist painting in Chinese context. To respond to this uh, dilemma, they insisted on the freedom of artistic creation. In the book, What is Art? Lin Wenzheng used Charles Baudelaire's and Friedrich Schiller's theories to justify the autonomy of art. Lin Fengmian argued against Leo Tolstoy's idea that the, art, the value of art should be judged by the criteria of how many people it can attract. Lin Fengmian claimed that, quote, the concept of beauty should reflect the indistinct individuality, quote. On the other hand, however, these artists practice art with a very strong social responsibilities and emphasized educational value of artworks. In 1926, Lin Fengmian delivered a speech to artists in Beijing, saying that, quote, the reason why Chinese people are not interested in art is because we don't create innovative works. Quote, and innovative works should, as he continued, quote, express artists' emotions and communicate human sentiments, spiritual pleasure, and consolations. Quote. He tried to reform Chinese art through the modernist painting, because in this society's eyes, the traditional art, quote, only serve for reinforce the old feudalist values, teach people to be loyal to the emperor, to obey the authority, and repress the human natural desire, quote. In this sense, to express the individualist, the individual sentiments through modernist painting is to shoulder the responsibility of educating the public whose sentiments were repressed by the society. And Wu Dayu shared the same idea. As he said, quote, Picasso's Guernica is a pure reflection of the artist's personal sentiments, but at the same time, it affects the Spanish society, quote. In this way, they reconcile the utopian idea for, of art for art's sake and the utilitarian idea of art for society's sake. However, in the 1930s China, most people lived poorly and threatened by, by Japanese invasions. Moreover, the deep-seated tradition of morality dominated people's operation of art. In this context, other than a small number of intellectuals and liberalist artists, who else could have the time and interest to go to the exhibition and look at the paintings whose forms and colors were foreign to them? The art movement society came to an end with the burst of the Sino-Japanese War. Some scholars consider Chinese modernist painting in this period as a passive reaction to the West, assuming that Chinese artists could not fully understand Western modern arts. For example, Michael Sullivan commented, quote, artists tend to call them almost any modern Western movement that they did not understand futurism. How could they possibly understand Western modernism, quote, However, a close examination of the writings published in the Art Movement Society's magazine Apollo and Adam reveals that they understood Western modernism and modern art, not because they understood the, the progression of Western science and technology that led to the different art movements in the West, ranging from the, the Impressionism, Post-Impressionism, Surrealism, and Dada, and to the Dadaism but also because they were conscious of the relationship between 
the modern art and the bourgeois society. For example, in the 20th century, uh, uh, sorry, in the 20th issue, Apollo published an article criticizing the Western art for being reduced to the commodities of capitalist society. So they have this kind of critical thinking of the Western modern art and the bourgeois society. Also, some scholars consider their works as kind of formalism. As Gao Meiqin said, quote, many Chinese artists recognize the expressive power in color and line of modern European schools. Inevitably, many fell into the pitfall of formalism by pursuing the nuances of colors and lines, just as their predecessors had played with ink and brush. This comment can be true when considering that these artists stay in the studio and spend a long time experimenting with forms of lines, colors, and volumes through their um, still life painting and nude paintings. However, at the same time, they also create a number of paintings with subjects of poor class and political leaders to respond to these uh, political realities at that time. This. Instead of uh, sticking to the forms in an article we should pay attention, Lin Fengmian warned the artist not to blindly follow the Western styles. In this sense, their artistic experiments with forms should not be reduced to an obsession with formalism. Their passions for modernist painting and their hope of reforming Chinese culture had been inseparable. This mixed task is manifest in the three statements of art that I already um, quoted in the presentation. Here, I want to put them together and list here. The first one is a statement of work study program that they involved in before their departures for France. The second is a statement of Phoebus Society that they established in Paris. The last one is a statement of the Hangzhou Art uh, Acad National Art Academy, where they launched the Art Movement Society. The, mo the Art Movement Society exemplify the modern artist's response to the social transformation of China in the early 20th century. It suggests artists' complicated emotions about their practice of European modern paintings. Passionate, hopeful, anxious, patriotic, and critical. Thank you. Hello everybody, my name is Maria Evangelatu. I am Associate Professor of Mediterranean Studies at the History of Art and Visual Culture Department, UC Santa Cruz. And I am delighted today to present to you Lulina Novsovsky, who is a third year student in our Visual Studies PhD program. As a Byzantinist, I don't have the good fortune of being Lulin's advisor <laughs> because her topics focus on uh, modern and contemporary material. So I am substituting her primary advisor, Kyle Pari, who is on leave. But um, as a former director of graduate studies in our program, I have worked with her closely and I am really proud that she is our representative, our progress representative today. I would like to join everybody else in thanking the Getty for this great opportunity that our students have to present their work and get very valuable feedback. Um, Lulin got her BA in American Studies from Wesleyan and her MFA in Creative Writing from the University of Wyoming. In our program, she works with Kyle Pari on documentation and representation of disasters, and with Jennifer Gonzalez on memory and memorialization in public institutions. Her research addresses questions of landscape, trauma, and collective memory. Her dissertation will be a combination of creative writing and scholarly discourse, and will be a speculative memorialization of barren landscapes and sublime objects, from melting glaciers 
to quarantine seeds from the Arctic to China. So a very wide range of intellectual interests that also characterizes Lulin's other research activities. She has ongoing research projects concerning Jewish boxers in Auschwitz and atomic tourism in New Mexico. She has presented her work in numerous conferences and is the recipient of a number of fellowships, including the Freeman Foundation Fellowship for East Asian Studies, a fellowship from the Indonesian Ministry of Culture, and numerous artist residencies in the US. Today, she will present Classical Landscapes, Contemporary Ruins, Political Reclamation in Chang Kitchun's Drinking Tea by the River. Let me add that this project, uh, Lulin developed entirely without guidance from her Americanist advisors. So she's really eager to receive feedback and input. And again, that's a perfect example of how this conference is very valuable to our students. So please welcome me in, uh, join me <laughs> in welcoming Lulin. Thank you. Thank you so much. I want to echo um, sincere thanks to Rebecca and Chelsea and the Getty Research Institute for supporting graduate research and for um, giving us this opportunity to share our work with each other and all of you. And excuse me, I just realized I still have my cough drop in my mouth. <laughs> From 2009 to 2013, Zhang Kechun, a photographer from Chengdu, China, rode a fold-up bicycle along the banks of the Yellow River. He was 29 years old when he set out and documented his journey with a large format camera, often overexposing his shots. As a result, many of the 40 images comprising his Yellow River series are suffused with a bleached out ethereality. Alongside the river, oft considered the cradle of Chinese civilization, Zhang finds scenes that are derelict, frequently in turns whimsical, lonely, and dwarfing. <laughs> in contrast to a great deal of contemporary Chinese photography focusing on China's unfettered industrialization, industrial sublimity, and attendant ruin, by artists like Edward Bertinsky, for example, and Jiang Pingyi, Zhang's photographs capture wistful stretches, the quietly and sparsely populated spaces in China that do still exist. Yet the images do not turn a blind eye to the consequences of China's development. They feature the mechanisms and architecture of industry, but subtly, from a poetic perspective. Less prescriptive and less didactic, Zhang's photographs invite a reimagination of the contemporary Chinese landscape and the political possibilities that are, while not frequently represented, embedded within it. The image I will focus on today is one that addresses contemporary environmental and social conditions, but by highlighting an ancient scene in its midst. Zhang Kuchun's Drinking Tea by the River is a distinctly painterly homage to traditional Shan Shui landscape painting. Shan Shui Hua, which translates to mountain water painting, was a style born out of the fifth century during the Tang Dynasty. It matured during the Song Dynasty, which lasted from 960 to 1279, and was for centuries practiced by scholarly elites. Traditionally done in ink and brush, on rice paper, Shan Shui painting uses the forms of natural elements like rocks, trees, mountains, and water to create highly spatialized and imagined natural scenes, relaying Taoist ideals of harmoniousness with nature, while representing the artist's inner state of mind through the use of symbols, metaphors, and illusion. For instance, a figure contemplating a waterfall is a recurrent theme. Confucianism and Taoism both call upon the natural qualities of water as a metaphor for virtues of endurance, sharpness of mind, resilience, and adaptability amongst changing environments. Shan Shui works thus conveyed one's serenities and struggles within the confines of a Confucius social and political order, 
doing so via subtle and symbolic representations in one's place, of one's place in the natural world. Especially in the last 20 to 30 years, many contemporary artists have adopted the formal conventions of Shan Shui painting in social, political, ecological expressions of melancholy, anguish, and hopelessness. However, many of these works are emptied of the symbolisms that characterize the classical form from which they draw their inspiration. A quick Google search of Shan Shui painting rarely yields the iconic classics from the Song Dynasty, but rather the photo montage works of artists like Yang Yongliang, an artist born in Shanghai in 1980, and Yao Lu, born in 1967. Yang and Liu are two of the more well-known contemporary artists working in the visual vernacular of Shan Shui. Each meticulously and masterfully manipulates photographs they've taken of urban sprawl, landfills, among other sites, seamlessly blending them with the motifs and compositional tropes of the Shan Shui form. Their work highlights the discord between a traditional reverence for nature and a con and a current indifference or even antipathy towards its preservation. This discord is illustrated especially through Yang's use, Yang's practice of Lin Mo, a long-standing tradition within Shan Shui painting where one copies the iconic works of masters. Thus from a distance, Yang's painterly photo montages appear as not just traditional paintings, but historically esteemed ones. So here's Chu Ding's Here's Chu Ding's 11th century work, Summer Mountains. And here below is Yang's appropriation and adaptation of it. Yang's black and gray mountains are crammed with skyscrapers. Cranes, oil derricks, and pylons appear like desolate tree trunks on a bleak wintry day. Lu's bluish green mountains harken back to a centuries old chromatic palette but his mountains are actually heaps of trash covered in tarps and netting. These depictions compel a viewer with an aesthetic familiarity with the Shan Shui form, but upon closer examination, we are unsettled to discover contemporary worlds with no sign of life, uninhabitable places that perhaps have already devolved beyond redemption. I consider Zhang Kuchun's photograph, Drinking Tea by the River, as one that resists the trend of using Shan Shui form to aestheticize scenes of dystopia. Instead, his use of the centuries-old form enables a portrayal and path to a more radical future. By not foregrounding environmental devastation, though still gesturing towards the environmental effects via smog and skyscrapers in ruin, Zhang's image draws attention to questions of public space and public discourse. His photograph, in part by intimating the Shan Shui form instead of overtly employing it, suggests the political potential of Shan Shui works beyond a commentary on environmental devastation. It complicates dystopian portrayals of China's physical environment by drawing the viewer's attention to political possibilities that exist within the photograph's frame. In the photograph, a large freestanding concrete arch dominates the left-hand side of the image. It's a remain of a former freeway support beam. Closer to the riverbank, two sides of another former arch look like short, sloping mounds, reminiscent of gentle mountains in Shan Shui paintings that recede into the distance. Each of these large concrete ruins has long vertical streaks running down its facade, emulating cascading waterfalls. In the image's background, stretching across the horizontal plane of the opposite riverbank, a series of skyscrapers stands shoulder to shoulder. The gray haze too feels reminiscent, evoking a diaphanous mist, though it is almost undoubtedly smog. An interesting tension arises in the image's composition. While the massive concrete arch dominates the left-hand side of the photo, the right-hand side features life, however tiny in comparison. Three figures sit at wooden tables while one stands over what looks like an improvised cooking stove. The four wooden tables are all identical with the intimation of a fifth cropped out of the frame. Wooden chairs like the tables are the fold up kind, easily and quickly transportable. This looks like a tea stall that's set up and taken down on a daily basis and if need be, at the drop of a hat. It's a makeshift operation. 
an enterprising individual has set up shop nestled between ruins. Whereas works like Yang and Luz portray the melancholy of ravaged and deserted landscapes where human life is no longer safe or viable, Zhang's image animates and complicates a scene of abandon since it is actually not at all abandoned. Rather, it's been collectively reclaimed and resuscitated, however modestly. Despite its situatedness among ruins, the photograph does not feel melancholic or resigned. Political theorist Pierangelo Sierra describes melancholia as the lack of a capacity to engage in politics. Thus, I read Zhang's photograph as potentially hopeful. The presence of this makeshift tea stall and its tea drinkers signals a potential stage for political discourse. It does so in the Taoist literati tradition of using subtlety, painting and interpreting these works through a lens of illusion and indirection. Zhang himself points us to the tea drinkers given the photograph's title, Drinking Tea by the River. It's the tea drinkers that make the image legible as more than or other than a lamentation of life among urban proliferation and its ruins. It's also a suggestion or contribution towards a new way of conceiving public space and reclaiming it. The photograph invites us to peer beyond the derelict terrain and its attendant forlornness exuded at first glance. It invites us to identify suggestibility in the image and pry it open, and there we can see an articulation of a newly activated political possibility. And while very nascent, these few men having tea here alludes to a classic Chinese pastime, visiting the tea house. And given its role, historic role as an informal, yet prominent site of civic debate, Zhang points us towards a tea stall with the, German, with the germinal intimations of a political arena. The vacant tables and chairs allow us to imagine the additional voices and players that can add to this emerging scene. There is room and invitation for more participants in evolving, rotating, and dynamic arrangement and rearrangement of the social possibilities inherent in even this small tea stall operation. The tea house is a distinctly culturally and historically vibrant, contentious, and influential political sphere particularly during the early to mid 20th century, and especially in Sichuan province from where Zhang hails originally. Tea houses were the most popular public places frequented by both commoners and elites. Heated discussions were standard fare. The tea house was a setting where locals across party and class divisions came daily to debate current social and political issues and reforms and for hours. There was even the birth of a new figure, the tea house politician, outspoken patrons who used the tea house as a stage to hold court and influence local politics. In her memoir published in 1911, writer Han Sui described the political climate of her home city. Chengdu was uneasy, irritable, anxious, the tea house in the public gardens and on the streets exuding this unease. Tea houses were no longer places for idle chit chat but full of political debates and activities. The call I buy tea was now practically a clarion call for an immediate drift of diverse loiterers, small groups coalescing into larger ones, some standing to listen as debates went on concerning the nationalization question and the railway loan, and silently they would drift apart again, then on to another tea house to hear another man expound. Wen Yi Do, a popular leftist writer and university professor, penned in the 1920s a widely beloved song, Cha Guan Xiao Diao, a canzonet of the tea house. After the dissolution of the Qing Dynasty in 1912, which ended over 2,000 years of imperial rule, political jockeying and cultural reforms characterized the next two decades. The lyrics of the canzonet illustrate the role that tea houses played and the pressures facing both owners and customers at a time when the government, as it continues to do, tried to suppress free speech by targeting the places where people gathered to speak openly and passionately about political issues. The lyrics speak for themselves. The night breeze is blowing dry air and the tea house is full of patrons thronging upstairs and downstairs where the waiter is calling out and bringing boiled water. Bowls and plates are junging while fried melon seeds are crackling. Some customers are chatting and some are arguing. Some are discussing national affairs and some are airing their complaints. 
The tea house keeper is so afraid that he comes to ask in a low voice, sir, please, out of concern for my business, never discuss your opinions about politics or national affairs. It is difficult not to complain, but you and I will suffer if your conversation causes a problem. You may lose your job and my tea house may be shut down, but losing your job is not the worst. You might be put in jail. What you should talk about is the weather and then go home and sleep well after drinking tea here. Ha ha, everybody is laughing. The tea house owner is talking nonsense because we have had too much sleep. More sleep makes us stupid and more frustrated. Instead, let's talk without taboos. Get rid of the bastards who oppress us, exploit us, and don't let us speak freely. So while the few tables in Zhang's photograph comprise a tea stall that may in no way rival the tenor or intensity of such aforementioned tea houses, the image can be read as a nod to the legacy of the tea house as a place for people of all class standings and political affiliations to gather and debate. It's an invitation to imagine that in a marginal place and a liminal time, between the collapse and neglect of a freeway infrastructure and before the debris is bulldozed and the land is developed again, there is a window where this site exists as a public domain available for reclamation. Its use can be determined by its inhabitants, bottom up and not top down. The site is not delineated, the space is amorphous, the ground uneven. There are no walls, no applicable health code. It's not governed or administered, there's no oversight, no set of enforced regulations that tend to typify urban life. In the image, we don't see any indication of use, sanctioned or not, aside from the tea stall as an indeterminate space available to multiple iterations and use by various actors, whether tea drinkers, tea stall owner, and Zhang himself as an artist on a pilgrimage, that neglected peripheral space is transformed into a public one. Zhang's ephemeral portrayal, with its subtle offering of political references recalling both the 10th and 20th centuries, hints at dissent. Though seemingly banal with just a few players in an otherwise forgotten space, this image thus possesses potentially transformative implications. The tea stall owner has reclaimed space for his own endeavor, earning some money outside a surveilled system. Through the simple act of creating a place for people to sit and drink tea, he and his customers have breathed life into what might be considered otherwise a wasteland. Further, whether unwittingly or not, they've contributed to a legacy of the tea house as an arena for political debate. Unlike the proprietor in Yi Do Song, there is no figure meddling in the conversations of the tea drinkers. There is no indication that their conversations could warrant fear of external pressures. We see their relaxed postures, however pixelated, apologies, which counter common depictions of Chinese workers dispossessed of their rights, migra migrating out of necessity, oppressed by soulless industrialization. So while the prominence of ruin initially dominates the scene, therein lies a transformative tension in which the presence of the figures converts ruin into destination. A different vision of China is called forth, one rooted in historical reverence, yet prime for contemporary suggestion. Through Zhang's lens, a site of demolition subverts an anticipation of melancholy and is instead recompensed and recomposed. In an environment fraught with inequality and destruction, where can one find quiet, a place to speak freely without restraint? However modestly or momentarily, how can one disentangle from the overpowering structures of capitalist growth and the choking smog of state-sanctioned suppression. Zhang's photograph offers a potential answer by inviting us to drink tea by the river. Thank you. Hi. I'm Susan Laxton, Associate Professor of Modernism and the History of Photography at University of California, Riverside. I'm here today in my capacity as graduate advisor 
since Camilla Quarren's dissertation advisor, Aleka LeBlanc, is on research leave in Brazil. So Camilla's not my advisee, but I wish she were. She advanced to candidacy last fall with a proposed dissertation, Dialectics of Malandrage, when arts transform the outcast into a hero, which argues for the Afro-Brazilian concept of malandrage, or trickery, as central to the politics of representation during Brazil's military dictatorship, 1964 to 1985. The project is distinctive for its unprecedented treatment of the complexity of advanced art in Brazil during the authoritarian regime, when it necessarily walked a tightrope between affirmation and criticality. Camilla has also distinguished herself as UCR's 2016 California Museum of Photography Fellow, an appointment that includes the opportunity to curate a photography-related exhibition at UCR's Museum Consortium her exhibition, Exile, The Land of Non-Belonging, opens this May, on the 25th of May, in fact, and we hope to see you all there. And it explores both the negative and positive effects of uprootedness on identity in the works of six artists in exile from Afghanistan, Cuba, Iran, Nigeria, the United Arab Emirates, and Vietnam. But Camilla's talk today it takes its title and its theme from her dissertation, um, Dialectics of Malandrage, When Arts Transform the Outcast into a Hero. Thank you, Susan, for the introduction. I also would like to thank Rebecca and Chelsea and anybody involved in the organization of this fantastic symposium. Um, now I have the daunting task of being the last uh, presenting after such um, excellent presentations and very rich um, discussions. So I thought I would start with a very um, powerful work. In 1970, one of the most innovative and eclectic artists of the 20th century, Sildo Meirelles, took 10 live chickens and tied them to a pole thrust into the ground. He poured gasoline on them and set them on fire, burning them alive. The audience was shocked and the police was called. The gruesome animal sacrifice was meant as a metaphor for the brutal torture and death of political prisoners perpetrated by the authoritarian regime um, during Brazil's military dictatorship. The military dictatorship in Brazil began in March 1964 with the coup d'etat at the hands of the armed forces that overthrew the then president João Goulart and ended 21 years later in 1985. The methods and scope of repression varied during the two decades of the dictatorship. In particular, Institutional Act No. 5, a decree enforced in December 1968, about 50 years ago, uh, was the most severe and repressive measure adopted by a regime that suppressed civil and political rights and used torture as a tool of intimidation. As a result, Artists, journalists, intellectuals, and politicians were not only censored, but in some cases also detained, killed, or forced into exile. The dictatorship had a strong impact on artists' freedom and artistic choices. Censorship criteria for the visual arts were unclear, and punishment of transgression was often inconsistent. The result was, on the one hand, a self-imposed censorship among the artists, and on the other hand, a sparking of creative solutions to produce artworks that allowed them to elude censorship and spread critical messages against the government. The use of ephemeral materials, conceptual embodied art, and performance at the time could not be read only in light of, of international artistic trends. These new forms of artistic expression originated also as a reaction to the limitation of freedom imposed by the government. Sildo Meirelles controversial work was part of the five-day exhibition Du Corpo a Terra, From Body to Earth, 
curated by the art critic Federico Moraes, which took place in Belo Horizonte, capital city of Minas Gerais, in April 1970, when the Institutional Act No. 5 had just been issued and repression of civil and human rights was at its peak. The title of the work, Ciradenci's Totem Monument to the Political Prisoner, refers to Ciradenci's, a dentist who, came a leading, who became a leading member of the revolutionary movement against the Portuguese monarchy during the 18th century in Minas Gerais. After being accused of conspiracy against the crown, he was hanged and his body was dismembered and displayed in the main square of Ouro Preto, a colonial town not far from Belo Horizonte where Meireles' action took place. Ciradentis became a martyr and national hero. Mereles' work thus drew a parallel between the violence of the punishment of Ciradentis and the torture of political prisoners during the repressive military regime. Scholars have interpreted this and other works produced during the military dictatorship using the metaphor of guerrilla art. This idea was first proposed by Federico Moraes, who in 1970, right before organizing the exhibition From Body to Earth, wrote a seminal essay where he stated, quote, the artist today is a kind of guerrilla agent, as art is a form of ambush. Acting unexpectedly, where and when he is least expected, the artist creates a permanent state of tension, a constant expectation. Everything can transform into art, even the most common everyday event. The task of the guerrilla artist is to create for the spectator in distinct, uncommon, undefined situations, provoking in him more than aversion or repulsion, but fear. It is only in the face of fear, when all senses are mobilized, that there is initiative, that is, creation." End of quote. According to Moraes, thus, the artist operating under the authoritarian regime had to use surprise, act um, abruptly in daily activities, and take a critical position towards the sociopolitical context. Since then, the analogy with guerrilla has become, become the lens through which art historians have interpreted the strategies adopted by Brazilian artists to resist repression during the dictatorship. With this paper and with my dissertation, I nuance this interpretation and contend instead that artists who wanted to be critical of the authoritarian regime, including Meireles, looked at the malandro rather than the guerrilla as a source of inspiration. The malandro, which roughly translates as rogue or trickster, is someone who cleverly bends rules and outsmarts social conventions to oppose adversities. In this presentation, I will first define the figure of the malandro. I will then examine a selection of artworks um, to demonstrate that malandraging, trickery, rather than guerrilla, is the more accurate key of interpretation for many of the strategies and conceptual practices devised by the artist to circumvent censorship and circulate subversive messages. My work is informed by the fact that the malandro, which anthropologist Roberto da Mata has described as the emblem of the Brazilian people, has indeed Afro-Brazilian origins. In my analysis of malandraging in the visual arts, I recover the origin of the malandro by disclosing the numerous references to Afro-Brazilian culture in the artworks examined. So who is the malandro? In his text, Dialectics of Malandragem, literary critic Antonio Cangido analyzes the Brazilian figure of the malandro and argues that his malice results from the brutalities and injustices of life. He uses tricks to outwit people in position of power to restore a temporary sense of justice. The malandro has two contradictory images. One is positive and presents him as a well-humored character who elicits sympathy, who uses cunning as a weapon for survival against the adversities of life and to obtain advantages often illicit. The other is negative and associates malandraging with the refusal to work, with vagabondage and the potential criminality. To add to this ambiguity, the malandro is both a fictional and historical figure. Besides turning up in Brazilian folklore and literary classics, 
De Malandro emerged as a recognizable figure at the beginning of the 20th century in the bohemian and sketchy neighborhood of Lapa in Rio de Janeiro, as a charismatic bon vivant who enjoys bars and cabaret and never turns away from a fight even, even with the police. With his typical stroll or gingando, seductive mode of speaking, singular dressing, his success, success with women, his adversity to work, and highly individualized personality, the Melandro achieved a mythical status in the 1920s and 30s thanks to the samba songs that celebrated his astuteness and malice. After a period of neglect, starting from the 1960s, many artists, poets, and mu musicians, among others, celebrated the figure of the Melandro as a model of survival, success, and social wisdom. While the Melandro has received scholarly attention in music, literature, theater, and anthropology, this figure has not been explored with the deserved emphasis for what regards the visual arts. I will now offer some evidence of the importance of the Melandro for the study of the visual arts and the relevance of understanding Melandrage as a strategy of resistance. It is not indeed a coincidence that one of the most celebrated artists' magazine published in the 1970s was entitled Malas Archis, the name of a well-known trickster character from um, the Iberian and Brazilian folklore known since the 13th century, Pedro Malas Archis. The title is particularly apt given the fact that the name Malas Archis is composed by two words, Malas and Archis, that translate as wicked tricks or bad arts. I assert that the reference to the trickster in the title was an intentional strategy aimed at connecting the idea of malandrage to the arts. The founders of Malas Archis include important artists and intellectuals who used the magazine to disseminate the idea that artists had to assume a position outside the main art circuits, while at the same time producing works relevant for society. Artists had to stay at the margins, but not completely excluded from the art world and society. Like the Malandro, whose wings between order and disorder also, the artists needed to maintain one foot inside and the other outside of the conventional art system. Sildo Meireles, for instance, in one of the most well-known works, Insertions into Ideological Circuits, put into circulation Coca-Cola glass bottles that he had previously modified with subversive messages about the political situation in Brazil and the North American imperialism. He also touched instructions for the recipients to add their critical opinions and send the bottles back into circulation. The messages, printed in white um, silk screen, became visible only when the bottle was filled with the dark liquid. To spread his anonymous messages, Medellis used channels less subject to surveillance than the media and art institutions, and he called for the active participation of the receiver urging them to repeat the process in order to keep the counter-information flowing. Art historians Claudia Kallerman and Arthur Freitas, experts on Brazilian art produced during the authoritarian regime, have both interpreted this work as guerrilla art. Drawing from Moraes' work, they find an analogy between, between art and guerrilla, stating that artists, like the guerrillas, stung by the urgency of the situation, operated outside the institutions unexpectedly, rapidly, and assuming all the risks of a clandestine action. I challenge these interpretations and contend instead that artists who wanted to be critical of the dictatorship, including Sildo Meireles, used tactics that were more similar to malandrage than guerrilla. And even when using guerrilla tactics, I argue, Artists combine them with tricks and irony to dupe the authorities and the public without them realizing that they had been deceived. For example, also when spreading instructions on how to build a Molotov bomb using Coca-Cola bottles, Sildo Mereles was using malandrage to co-opt Coca-Cola's marketing system in order to disseminate his messages. Thanks to his weak tricks, his malas arches, he was able to exploit the strengths of the powerful capitalist North American company to his own ends. Moreover, contrary to guerrilla artists, um, contrary to guerrilla artists were not operating outside the art system. 
Meireles, for example, exhibited his modified Coca-Cola bottles in 1970 in MoMA's famous exhibition on conceptual art information organized by Kineston McShine. Though critical of the art institutions, artists still depended on them for funding and visibility. Thus, they operated at the margins, exactly as the malandro who, quoting Roberto da Matta, lives in the interstices between order and disorder, using both uh, and funding sustenance from those who are inside the normal structured world and those who are not. It is the malleability of the malandro to bo pass both as insider and outsider, his agility to bend the rules of the system without breaking from it, that got me interested in studying this figure. The question now is whether it is possible to use malandraging as a key interpretation also of the most provocative, violent, and shocking works produced in the 1970s in Brazil, such as Chiradentes. My research is supported by a thorough understanding of the figure of the malandro and his origins. Much of the scholarship on the topic, including the writings by Roberto da Matta and Antonio Candido, does not provide information on the origin of this figure, nor analyzes what are the social conditions that transform a person into a malandro and that concur to perpetuate the social differences against which he fights. It is in the literature on samba music, in particular about the songs that in the 1920s and 1930s celebrated the malandro's cunning, that it is possible to find references to his, his history. Scholars Ruben George Olivan and Lisa Shaw both argue that the malandro is an Afro-Brazilian anti-hero, and malandraging is to be understood as a survival strategy utilized during colonialism and to resist slavery. Author and journalist Roger de Durst, who has written the biography of one of the most controversial malandros, defines malandraging as a movement of resistance of a culture that is preta, pobre, proletaria, black, poor, and, pro and proletarian, against the values imposed from the outside and above, and it was therefore among the cultural exp expressions that the state tried to annihilate. Nevertheless, Official attitudes towards Afro-Brazilian culture changed in the 1930s with the arrival in power of President Getulio Vargas, who put in place policies in order to create a strong and recognizable national identity and to spur the economy and development. Vargas' government transformed manifestations of ethnic identity, such as samba music and dance, syncretic religions like candomblé, and the rhythmic martial art capoeira into symbols of national identity, thus attenuating their power as practices of dissent and resistance. Anthropologist and historian Lilia Schwarz called this a process of desafricanization or de-Africanization. This dynamic of racial domination can explain the obliteration of the Melandros Afro-Brazilian origins from much of the literature and popular knowledge. In my analysis of malandraging in the visual arts, I recuperate the origin of the malandro and emphasize the importance um, and the important impact that Afro-Brazilian culture had on the visual production by non-Afro-Brazilian artists during the dictatorship. It is meaningful that while Frederico Moraes, before the opening of the exhibition From Body to Earth, had incited artists to act as guerrilla agents, in a review of that same exhibition, art critic Francisco Bittencourt defined the group of political engaged artists as Geração Trancahuas, the Trancahuas generation. Trancahuas literally translates as blocking streets. And in fact, on the street, you can see um, a photograph of an urban intervention by artist Paolo Bruschi, who literally blocked a very busy street in the city of Recife using a pink ribbon, um, dis disrupting the traffic as an act of civil, um, civic disobedience. Going back to Trancahuas. Trancahuas is also the appellative given to an Umbanda deity, Eshu, often described as a malandro, the guardian of order and disorder. Trancahuas is a spiritual entity with the power to clear or, bl or block a person's way, determining his or her future. 
In order to please the spiritual entity, one must leave, leave offerings, usually in the form of sacrificed animals, food, liquor, perfumes, candles. Roberto Conduru, an expert on Afro-Brazilian art and culture, has observed the similarity between Merele's work, Chiradenchis, and the religious sacrifices performed in the Afro-Brazilian syncretic religion, Umbanta. He claims that the animal sacrifice, unacceptable in itself, would be justifiable in the political context of the so-called lead years of the dictatorship in which Meireles operated, as much as it is accepted in Afro-Brazilian cults when it is done to create a communion between the gods and the faithful. By observing the similarity of the setting of Chiradenchis and the shrine dedicated to a shoe, it becomes clear um, the strong connection between the work of Sildo Mereles and Afro-Brazilian religion and culture becomes clear. And in fact, on the, here, on the right, you can see the image of a malandro, right? And here you can see the offerings of different birds and here we have the horns, probably, of a goat. To conclude, therefore, also the most radical works produced in the 1970s that made use of tactics similar to guerrilla did have a profound connection with the malandro and his modus operandi, malandragem. Thank you. Thank you, Yixing, Luling, and Camilla for three really engaging papers. I'd like to welcome you back to the stage now and also introduce Kui Shen, our moderator, who is vice chair and director of the PhD program of the, of the Visual Arts Department at the University of California, San Diego. His research focuses on modern and contemporary Chinese art, and among his publications are A Century in Crisis, Arts of Modern China, Light Before Dawn, Lian Yao, and Painting Her Way. He is the recipient of fellowships and awards from the NEA, the Social Sciences Research Council, Japan Society for the Promotion of Science, Stanford University, Leiden University, and others. Welcome. Oh, oh, first, I want to thank three, this, uh, three speakers and gave a wonderful paper. It's really learned a lot. And uh, <clears throat> I, I think the... Uh, uh, among the three papers, I think kind of one thing maybe can link them together uh, is the relationship between the arts and politics. So in the in the um, Yiching's paper, we can see uh, this uh, group, the very uh, ide idealistic uh, artists, they study in Europe uh, and back to China uh, after the during the period after China overthrew the, uh, the last dynasty and established a new republic. This period. And this artist uh, the, uh, closely work with the government to actually make the kind of uh, very uh, enthusiastically involved this and uh, we should say the, uh, the collective effort with the government to trying to uh, the establish a new uh, the uh, education and art education system and also the uh, the introducing the new kind of the Western kind of the uh, art concept and also the art techniques into chi into China, and uh, we should say that time that these uh, this the, the as Yi Qing already point out that we see the this kind of craft uh, the effort uh, we think is very important and also the showing this short period actually the, the appeared later uh, we will see uh, it's uh, during uh, uh, because the Sino Japanese War interrupted. So this kind of effort actually uh, basically failed. <coughs> and uh, uh, after the 1949 is another story, after communists uh, took over China, and this, uh, we see this kind of entire this process of the modern, uh, the, the development of modern art basically stopped not until the 1980s <coughs> re emerged. And uh, in the uh, second paper, I think is also very interesting, uh, this uh, Lulin's paper, and uh, it's uh, bring see the the contemporary Chinese art actually they are uh, the uh, bring the very kind of the uh, 
it's a kind of glorious kind of catalog, uh, cat, uh, catalog, uh, category of the Chinese painting is the shan shui or the landscape. Uh, the, uh, back to the, the contemporary Chinese art, and it actually to make the kind of the uh, these kind of the, the themes turn the themes to the the social critical commentary, and to deal with the issue of the Chinese contemporary society. And the interesting we see is the you know after the uh, the for years of the about the two decades this the. Uh, this contemporary art is completely marginalized from the, uh, the mainstream Chinese art, and the Chinese authorities started to absorb, trying to seem absorb this contemporary into their own. Uh, this kind of uh, this uh, uh, strategic plan, especially used as soft power, right? We see this kind of group of the contemporary Chinese arts now actually the, become the the presented of Chinese. Uh, this, uh, the, the, uh, the, the contemporary art appeared in the international art world. So we see this kind of the, uh, the, the, the relation between the art. It's uh, different from uh, the Yichings, uh, the group, uh, the talk about group artists. At that time, we see the, uh, these kind of the more mutual kind of active effort between the, uh, this, uh, the artist and also the government in the short period. But this time in the contemporary art, we can see this relation between the contemporary artist and the, uh, the, 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 the authority actually mm, it's very subtle and in some way kind of manipulated. And uh, the uh, contemporary Chinese artists use this actually to, uh, to try to, uh, to, to, to deal with social issues, uh, but the government actually used as uh, for their own agenda. We can see the very interesting. And also for the uh, Camilla's paper, I think it's very interesting. You can tell I'm not the expert of the South American art, and uh, <laughs> so. Uh, the, uh, but I think the, the contrast to the uh, ruins, uh, this paper you can see uh, that instead of you use this kind of the, uh, the, the theme of the uh, this uh, the, the shan shui or, or the symbol of the glorious uh, Chinese art in the ancient art, the classical uh, means back to the contemporary art. I think it's very interesting. We see uh, in this uh, period of the dictatorship, the 20 years of dictatorship in Brazil, Brazil we see the, uh, this group of the artists, avant-garde artists, actually they use uh, uh, all different way uh, to, in different cities to try to uh, transform this uh, Melander. Uh, this, this is uh, the kind of the figure of our law uh, to the to become the kind of the hero and become the symbol of the resi resistance and also the uh, someone also turn on the uh, appropriate or the, uh, deploy this kind of the uh, this uh, the Melendez uh, the kind of strategy to deal with the issues with censorship and also use them to challenging this kind of existing art institutions. So I think it's very interesting we see this how this uh, played art and the, the politics played in uh, this uh, the very unique this the dictators. Uh, shipped the period in Brazil. So I think that also I uh, maybe just uh, give some questions to the, uh, each individual. Uh, you can answer the can, can similar way. And for each, thing, I think the, you know, uh, you already point out this, uh, this uh, uh, the, all the effort made by, efforts made by this group of artists at the time. Uh, the, although with the support of the government at the time, we should say, uh, but eventually, uh, this uh, failed in many ways. But still, uh, we we know uh, this uh, modern art kind of reemerged re like 50 years ago. But it, what is the legacy of this group? The artists actually played a role in the Chinese society, even during the suppression period, start from about 50 and 60. This period, what kind of role they played there, and how did they in estimated the later in the 80s? Uh, this the, when the reemerging of the modernist art uh, when the, uh, China the reopened their door to the world. So this is, can you if you can uh, this elaborate later. Mm -hmm. And for Luling, I think it's very interesting. Uh, you see this uh, uh, the 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 contemporary artist actually use this uh, uh, kind of the. The, the classical means trying to uh, trying to 
make the, their uh, social country there. But the, we see the government actually the, uh, the, the take the different kind of strategy. In your observation, is how these kind of the contemporaries, I know you not only uh, the, the study the, the uh, Zhang Kechun, but also you have the many, uh, the many other artists who work, especially deal with the same kind of the themes. How do they deal with issue? How deal with this kind of the, uh, this, uh, the from the authorities' parts, and how these contemporary artists deal with them? Yeah, if you can say something. And for uh, Camille, I think the, uh, maybe it's not really a critical question. As a complete outsider, maybe I just uh, have some kind of curiosity. Uh, some lenders' image, uh, this, uh, and continue to play the role uh, in the Brazil art after the uh, finish of the dictatorship. Uh, and also, uh, as this, you call it the great art, it still is a part of the important parts of the Brazil art after this period. Yeah, I answered first. Thank you for bringing this up. Uh, it's a great question about the modern art movement society's roles in uh, later days when they um, when they failed um, in the 19, I think they contribute to the 50 and the 60s art world and later to the 80s art world in two ways. Um, first is for the second generation, so uh, about the second generation of Chinese modern artists, including uh, Wu Guanzhong and Zhao Wuji and Zhu Dequn, and these. Um, these artists became later well-known artists in the global world. Um, they before they went to, uh, before they went to France. They worked as uh, they worked in uh, they studied in the academy. And uh, Zhu Dequn and Zhao Wuji are uh, teaching uh, teaching assistants of um, in this academy. So this first generation of modern artists in the academy they played a very important role in instilling the modern thoughts and artworks to this young, younger generation. And uh, their influence continued in the 1980s, but in a different way, uh, on, the, on the third generation of Chinese modern artists. Uh, for example, this uh, last summer, last summer when I went back to Shanghai and in, in, uh, interviewed the artists, during the Cultural Revolution, um, although they couldn't have the opportunity to talk with this first generation of artists, but the, the articles and the art journals pub that published the first generation's artwork, uh, artists' works were circulated among uh, Yu Yohan and uh, Zhou Changjiang and uh, some other artists. I think this is indirect uh, influence in this um, artist who uh, lived in a society in which the socialist realism uh, prevailed in the society. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up because I think it's an especially important question um, regarding how a landscape tradition that often was used to subtly evoke um, dissent or um, like resist uh, the constraints of a certain social or political order, how now that the um, Communist Party is able to leverage the success of contemporary Chinese artists towards um, a political agenda to achieve um, more status, status on an international global stage, how contemporary artists who are working in ecological issues can resist having their work co-opted towards those ends. And so I think that's why I'm interested in works that are especially subtle. And if I consider the how typical maybe a political propaganda is an oversimplification of messaging and how the use of a Shan Shui form can be almost like a shorthand for perpetuating old ideas of like Tianxia or China's idea of um, being like the 
kingdom under the heavens as a certain, having a certain cultural superiority. I think that it works to the government's advantage to be able to show oh, the Shan Shui form. It's, uh, these artists are internationally reputable and it demonstrates the, the longevity and uniqueness and superiority of the Chinese arts. So I think that why I appreciate, appreciate um, John Kuchun's work and the work by other artists like He Xiang Yu or Chen Chun Hao, who also work with the Shan Shui form, but do so with their critiques such that they complicate the use of the form. So for example, and I liked how you showed a work that, um, sorry, this is a really long-winded answer. I'm gonna try. Um, use the works that have the Coca-Cola bottles almost as a contemporary global cultural shorthand for international capitalism. Um, there's a, He Shang Yu is an artist who employs a small legion of factory workers to boil down Coca-Cola to create a sludge that then he uses as ink to paint in the style of traditional Chinese landscape painting. So it's a commentary on industry, labor, and he's implicating himself in that, which I think draws attention away from the condemnation perhaps of the government um, and the like societal degradation that has resulted from um, the last like several decades of political reform or economic reforms. And then there's another artist, Chen Chun, uh, who also, he uses like tens of thousands of nails that he hammers into emulate, copy, uh, icon, Song, Song Dynasty classics as well. And so that's also kind of a modern meditation on, on labor again and industry. And so I think those artists allow for readings that, res even if they use a Shan Shui form, resist a kind of one-dimensional critique and maybe have ways of subtly indicting the entire network and matrix of neoliberal capital dissolution in China <laughs> and the world. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thank you. I, I think the, it's reminded me, you know, it's a use this essential, or use this landscape and the themes uh, to uh, reach this, uh, this uh, own political agenda. It's not, not new, actually, for the, in China. It's not too long ago. In the 1930s, at that time, actually, nationalist government also uh, used the century. But they, are, they were very successful at that time. Because at that time, they tried to uh, encourage kind of traditional Chinese artists to use this uh, uh, the landscape because they considered the, uh, the Tang Dynasty or Five Dynasty, the Chinese landscape, uh, is the, you know, the a glorious symbol of the golden age uh, in the Chinese art history. So that time, they also trying to use this to reestablish the Chinese, their own cultural identity and the image of the state, uh, because this the time they're trying to, in the international world and art world, to reestablish their own kind of the, uh, the image of a nation state and also the, uh, ch and the, the, the identity of the Chinese culture. So this, I think, uh, uh, that time, uh, Sanxue used very successfully um, by the government and also by uh, these artists that send the, uh, the art exhibitions to the Europe, to the, all the other parts of the world, and uh, basically used all the uh, contemporary artists, uh, the artwork mainly uh, their Sanxue, uh, their landscapes. So I think uh, this time, in the, uh, in the now, this uh, Chinese government is also trying to me, maybe they saw this kind of the previous uh, success in the uh, 50 or some years, years ago, and they, they trying to uh, they, they use this uh, soft power to do that. I think this uh, maybe, yeah, can yeah, connect to this too. Thank you for your comments. Um, I'm not sure if I understood your question. Is that more about the artists or about the Melandro? If it's yeah, both the, the role of Melando and also the artists. Right, so um, the artists that are described as the Trancahua's generation or they have also been described as the generation of the I Cinco de Institutional Act Number no. 5 are still active and they're producing amazing work also nowadays. Um, I think still using malandraging as well. Um, in terms, what is interesting is that all these artists are 
male artists of this particular group. Um, and they are considered politically active, um, although Sildo Mereles always refused to call himself a political artist. Um, so it was a group of uh, young male artists, and that's why I think also using the figure of the malandro is particularly apt, because the malandro um, has this idea of masculinity and virility linked to it. Um, and in terms of whether the figure of the malandro is relevant to interpret also artworks that were produced after the end of the dictatorship, um, I do believe that artists are using um, malandraging, um, but if before we had maybe known Afro-Brazilian artists using these techniques, I believe now we have very interesting Afro-Brazilian artists, which in my opinion are um, often using malandraging to expose um, the very sharp social inequalities and ver the very tense uh, ra racial relationships um, that characterize also nowadays Brazilian society. Um, though I did only very preliminary research this summer, so not all of them um, agree with this key interpretation, so this is something that I will develop further. Thank you. Now I think the time is open to the, the floor. Any questions? I think we're all familiar with the fraught relationship between modernism, whether in art history or in socioeconomic terms, and its connection to myths of progress and development. They're, of course, very hard to get away from, and you see this all, you know, recently in all these exhibitions and other things that try to look at the origins of abstraction and which always end up positing that, you know, you're on the way to something and then uh, that's progress. Um, of course, that's that myth of progress has been challenged for a long time and one of the places that it really uh, in particular is in Latin America, and thing, of things like the film Memories of Underdevelopment. And the ecological movement, both of which have been uh, central to questioning progress and development, but they have their own potential drawbacks, which is I think both identifying with an alterity that one doesn't actually embody or a kind of nostalgia or the positing of uh, some pure time in the past, which also seem like uh, myths. And I just wondered, I think, Hopefully that connects in some way to all three of you, so. Well, thinking about modernism and the idea of progress, I think a very good question that you're raising is progress for whom or development for whom? Um, so when a country embarks in large projects of development or in modernization, oftentimes there are sectors of society that are excluded. Um, and so we had that drawback that, of course, government try to uh, hide, right? They try to emphasize the successes and not talk about um, the... Um, criticalities. Um, so I think this is something that characterized um, Brazil, especially during the 20s and 30s, when we have um, the emergence of the malandro in the neighborhood of Lapa, when we have um, uh, Getulio Vargas government um, that is itself a dictatorial government that is pushing for modernization 
but that modernization excludes um, the population of African descent. And we have to remember that Brazil is the last country in the Americas to abolish slavery in 1888, so quite recently. Um, and so then there is, as a reaction to these adversities and to, as a reaction to this exclusion, then a person might have to choose to um, use tricks to survive and so become a malandro. Um, so I think this then reflects also in later years, also during the dictatorship, when again we had an effort from the part of the government to promote the country, also um, to attract investments from outside, but again, uh, hiding the fact that there were large sectors of the population that were left behind. So I'm not sure I'm answering the question, but I think it's interesting to think of modernity and thinking of development and just trying to understand for who does this development work. I also think about this development and modernism in Chinese context and its drawbacks uh, generated in this mo modernization, the process of modernization. And I think uh, in the case of my study, um, one aspect of this modernity and that relates, relates to the art movement society is that they um, publicize, they, they make the, the fine arts to be public to the audience. And this is very important because they engage art in the, in the larger, broader social uh, context. And of course, uh, in the process that they were so eager to be modernized, um, they also regard everything new as progression, as a, as a mode of progression. They welcome new things. Uh, at the same time, they criticize the, the old culture. It may be a little bit more progressive. Um, in the 1950s, after this artist's experiment with all kinds of uh, modern forms, and they also started to rethink the value of traditional art in the contemporary context. Um, they started to create landscape painting and it, with integrating the Western forms and the, the Chinese traditional um, concept of landscape because they find the spiritual pursuit in the Chinese classical landscape painting still workable and still valuable in the contemporary context. I think that in the, back, in the, back to the 1920s and 1930s, they, they kind of were too um, eager to uh, integrate this, uh, these two cultures uh, because um, the the series of social movements, political, political uh, revolutions that push them to think about new things, new things, new things. And I think after this hot wave, they began to be uh, more cool-minded and respond the, to the um, more like classical culture. Yeah. Thank you for bringing up the question of um, modernization, the myths of progress, because I think something that um, I'm interested in, in how contemporary uses of classical Chinese landscape painting really draw attention to the multiple registers of time operating simultaneously, or time scales, and, um, and how maybe dystopian representations foreclose the possibility of even imagining future progress, that it's already too late. Though I think it's interesting and important to note that China I think is only second to the Netherlands in terms of the work that they're doing to lower carbon emissions and taking the lead on, on a lot of uh, in, uh, environmental initiatives. Um, but I think that this speaks back to our conversation earlier um, 
the very interesting conversation that was happening here earlier about historical memory and when certain historical memories are resuscitated um, and to what end and what purposes they serve. And so myths of progress, what moments in time are brought back, what moments they glamorize or erase, I think is interesting to try to identify where in an image even we can detect how time is the tension of time and then how the relationship between the artist and the government in what periods of time um, are being um, highlighted to demonstrate certain ideological ideas of progress. Uh, thank, thank you all three presenters. I have one question for Camilla and one for Lu Ling. My question to Camilla has to do with cruelty. And um, I guess I'd like, I'd be interested if you could reflect on the uh, relationship between cruelty to animals and cruelty to human beings that the work foregrounds. And um, if, uh, you know, is uh, it seems to me that's something in excess of whether the artist is an outsider or not. Um, it occurred to me, for example, is this work really about cruelty as an objective phenomenon in the universe that um, transcends political boundaries, et cetera? Is it about the self-flagellation um, the, the masochism, really, of the, the artist who consents to um, not only do this cruel act, but internalize that cruelty for the rest of his life, as it were, as part of the inscription of a heinous political system on his own psychology. But something along those lines for you to reflect on. And then I'll ask my question of Lu Ling. So go ahead. Thank you very much for your question. Um, it's interesting because in the 1990s, in an interview with Gerardo Mosquera, a Cuban critic, Sildo Merele stated that he would never repeat again uh, something like Chira uh, and that the suffering of the chickens was still part of his psychological memory and that he could not get over that but that he strongly felt that in the 1970 that was necessary. Do you want to add something? Well, no, that's, that's fascinating, thank you. I mean, I, I think in your response there's, the, there's a double temporality. There's 1970 and then the 90s, and that, of course, makes total sense. I think it's part of the, 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 the fear-inducing power of the work of art that it seems that the artist must know that's going to haunt him for his whole life. Not, it's not that's not going to occur to him later. That's going to be something he's going to go to his grave with, and that's part of the um, intensity of of the piece. I also believe that it speaks of the faith that the artist has in art, and yes. the idea that there will be an impact, there will be an awakening. So that sacrifice will not be useless. To, to be able to produce that sacrifice, there must, be, like, there must be this strong faith that something will generate from that. Yeah, that's beautifully said. And um, right, we, we could talk about it. But it does strike me as having something in common, that piece with the uh, works by like Chris Bar Burden that have to do with a evident um, masochism, like I consent to destroy myself in some way in the name of the cause I believe will be benefited by what I do to myself as well as to other living things. Uh, my question for Lu Ling is just to do with fiction. And so looking at that marvelous photograph, I, it occurred to me at least that it looks something like say a Gregory Crutzen photograph and so it looks um, like it's a concoction in a way, the, the folding chairs, the sort of like a, you know, a, a pop-up um, tea ceremony, which I say in a complimentary way, I don't know if you, you might know one way or the other whether it is fictional or whether that's an actual 
T service that's provided, but my question really is about the relation between fictionality and political change. So I think the power of that photo, and I would love to be corrected by anybody who's familiar, I know a few of you are familiar with John Kuchun's work, that my understanding is that it was entirely a documentary project, and so those images were not staged. Um, and so he's happening upon moments which I think are powerful because they are so resonant with classical formal compositions, yet came upon them uh, with some measure of coincidence. Um, and so I think what is interesting about the image to me is trying to analyze it or interpret it in a, in a Taoist literary tradition of reading it, spec in, reading it for illusion, which I think allows for a degree of speculation um, and being able to imagine what the scene without knowing whether in fact that tea stall owner is selling tea or if they're friends who have brought the tables and chairs together, that it invites an imagination for what their arrangement could suggest and that I also appreciated the first panel, the discussion about representation and documentary and its um, unique intersection with political possibility because I do think that um, there's something more powerful to coming upon a tea stall operation in among ruins um, than staging something like that in a site of abandon. I have three quick questions. Um, Lu Ling, I have been sitting here racking my brain trying to remember, but I think the name is Bada Shanren, the whole idea that there was a tradition of, or there were, it was not a tradition, but there were traditional painters who had always had embedded in their work a kind of critique of power, works that spoke against power. Do you think that Zhang is that he is in, this is has been instilled in in his um, mental framework. I am resistant to speculate, but would like to say yes, um, because I think in seeing his works overall, there is a consistent. Um, I think a very uh, subtle form of dissent that um, that resists relis, resists the strictures that society might place um, on its every like on its ordinary citizens and what that would look like in the public imagination. So I feel like there's almost a kind of dissent to the overall contemporary depictions of um, mainland China and the life of um, ordinary Chinese citizens, as well as a commentary against, ab about the conditions that would make one feel potentially oppressed. So I think so, thanks. Quick question for, um, uh, for Camilla. Um, is there a malandra as well as a malandro? This is an excellent question, and I, in my dissertation, I am really willing to find a malandra. So we, do, there is a malandra in um, Umbanda, the religion I was mentioning before. Um, the malandra is called Pombajira, and so yeah, it's a female malandro. Um, is there a malandra in the arts, um, or where? female artists who were critical of reg the regime using malandragem, I think that would be a little bit of a stretch. So um, I need to investigate further, but the question of gender is uh, for sure very important. Thank you. And finally, Yijing, I just have to say, your archive blows me away. Where is it? <laughs> In Shanghai Library and uh, Hangzhou, uh, Province, uh, Jiangsu Province Archive Center. It's just, it's just amazing to see 
this, this trace mm -hmm. as opposed to the paintings. And when you say that none of the paintings exist, none of the paintings exist. So it is just this index. Yes, I can find some productions in art journals and uh, art magazines back at that time. Um, this is a really more of an observation, but I guess also a, I'd be interested in a response from Lu Ling about um, that beautiful and so interesting image uh, you showed us. Um, as an architectural historian, it probably isn't surprising that the two things that stuck out to me about it were the way it uses architecture and the way it talks about history. And I was, in particular, I was struck by it made me think, actually, of um, Bataille's um, uh, writings about architecture and about architecture as a kind of image of structure and of regimentation. And the ruin on the side of this side of the river, uh, which is like an ironic ruin, in a sense, that it evokes an ancient ruin, an aqueduct, a Roman ruin from you know the kind of classical lands of ruins, and yet it's a disused freeway um, concrete. You know, it's from the last wave of modernizations pointing towards this current wave of modernizations. And dividing the two is the river, which is like the primordial symbol of history and of time. So without wanting to overdetermine it, this as like this, you know, purely symbolic image or anything. I, and, and I'm not really so necessarily concerned with <laughs> the intention of the artist or anything, but I mean, I, I, to what extent do you do you think that those kinds of things are are kind of meaningfully present in the image? Um, um, thank you for that question. I'm really happy to hear that you also found the image to be beautiful because this is um, not the Chinese landscape painting is not um, an area of like my research focus, but I saw this image and I just found it so arresting and it invited so much contemplation. I thought that. I just really wanted to dig into it. So I, I really appreciate hearing that it resonated as well. So I think that you made a really interesting observation, important one, that the freeway art, the, like the structure ruins of the freeway, kind of, they're in opposition to the flow of the river. And I think it's important that John Kuchun, he made his, his journey alongside the river. He was following the path of um, this 1940s novel and that traveling with the like the archetypal mother, the the his, the course of hi, um, history, the that that's really significant and symbolic that the 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 tea drinkers are drinking tea alongside the river and find refuge between the ruins as opposed to being in the direction. They're not like facing the opposite skyscrapers, um, or you don't get the sense that there's like a, an enjoyment of the industrial sublimity of the scape and instead the, the ruins kind of work like a makeshift, um, not like necessarily protection, but that I think compositionally it is striking that those ruins, that, that the freeway, that modernism, is bro that was broken. Um, and that it hasn't been rebuilt. So what, where that direction was going, does it no longer need to go? Um, yeah. I feel like the implication almost is that the tea drinkers are the most permanent thing. <laughs> and that, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, that's, that's why the, there's something ironic about the ruins yeah. of the freeway. Right, no, I think that's beautiful because I think being part of a, an ancient legacy it's almost like if it's not them, it might be somebody else. And even though there's transience um, with the tables and the ruins, there is the return of an of an ancient yeah activity. So thank you. That's yeah. Thank you. 
Thank you all. And I also have a question for Lu Ling. <laughs> it's the first time I see the entire presentation, so I was struck by, by the difference between the artists who create the aesthetic dystopian visions, as you said, and your photographer's work. And I, I wonder, how, what do you think about the importance of the human figure in your photographer's work? Because it, it, the way I understand it, his work is very personal because of these unexpected human figures that populate the landscape, while the other artists abstract so much, uh, and therefore it's easier, I guess, for the government to co-opt those <laughs> creations because they are very impersonal. <laughs> so I, I just wanted to hear your thoughts Great. on this. Yeah, thank you. I think that's a really good observation because not being able to see human life in the figure allows it to look as if it's um, a mountain that could be from the 10th century, the 5th century, an abstracted mountain. And so while um, the works by the artists that I showed that have those dystopian renderings have tiny, tiny figures, they're always alone and isolated, but not positioned in such a way where with classical works you could um, read their positioning, their gaze, their placement as being symbolic of a certain internal condition. So I think the fact portraying a gathering of people having a relaxed and intimate conversation, I think that's for me where the political possibility lies because um, there's discourse, there's subversive use of space, there, but it's collective. And so I think in those other works, if you're a lone figure wandering, it feels very post-apocalyptic. Like, are you the only one left? And would you even want to still be there then? <laughs> yeah. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for your presentations. Uh, I have two questions for I Ching. Um, so uh, thank you so much for walking us through this super rich archival materials, and I think it's very clear that in the discourses of this materials, there is um, binaries between China and the West, the tradition and modern. Um, I wonder, in your opinions, um, this binary of China and West, tradition and modern, as theoretical framework, um, is this still productive or not productive for us as art historians to look at modern Chinese art and visual culture? And, um, and my second question actually is uh, following in the archival thing. Um, so due to the fact that the many early 20th century Chinese or, or the or, original Chinese paintings were lost or destroyed, um, do you see this as a challenge or opportunity or both for your dissertation project? That's very good questions. Uh, well, thank you for bringing up this dualist model between West and East, between tradition and modern. So um, I also think about this, this model um, during de developing this uh, dissertation. Well. It seems that there is a um, dualist model between between these two, um, the, the regional dualism and this uh, dualism in terms of time periods. Um, but in terms of the specific works and the specific thoughts of each individual artist, and this dualism uh, to me, it seems hard to stand the water because um, this, uh, since the, their artworks were not, uh, did not survive today, but I can uh, analyze some works created later by these artists. For example, Lin Fengmian, the, the leader of the society. Um, in, in his later works, he combined the the art of lines that was emphasized in a, a kind of traditional uh, expression of Chinese painting. Chinese painters always pay much attention to the lines. And the cubist um, way of constructing uh, plastic, uh, so-called plastic uh, reality. So this combination, we can see this 
um, it is a extreme a dualism or more kind of uh, integration after absorbing these two two kinds of thing two, two two cultures and also in the early nineteen in the early twentieth century uh, Chen Hongke already uh, think about this this issue and he thinks the modernist painting share some similarities with Chinese classical painting um, in terms of their spiritual pursuits. And so I think uh, in order to respond to this dualist model, I need to specif specify into some works and times. Um, in terms of the, when, we, when it comes to 1980s, this um, dualist m model was um, furthermore blurred. Um, and your second question is the the absence of these actual paintings were, were destroyed. It is a, a challenge or opportunity for us. I think, yes, both. It is a challenge because, we, like um, Cai Yuanpei uh, comments on their works as integrating the Chinese, pure Chinese elements and the, the, the Western modern painting elements. So I couldn't tell. I couldn't tell this integration because their works were not there. But it is also a opportunity to explore um, the reasons why this, um, the reasons why um, this painting were gone. And back to um, this third question about the drawbacks of 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 the modern development. I think I can cooperate your, your questions here. It's always, um, we always confronted, confronted with an issue of belated, belatedness, which means that the Western modern arts um, developed sen uh, since in the 18th, seven, since the, uh, around the middle of 19th century, right? That the first impressions painting was created in 1872, right? Um, and after decades later, and the same styles appeared in China. So when we talk about the global art history, we always think of this belatedness. And I think this, the, the destroyed works here, um, also a, a good opportunity for me to explore the why this work, the, I think is the presence of the belatedness in this period. I hope I answer your questions. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I have two questions, one for Yi Qing, another for uh, Ru Ling, and say hi to Camilla. <laughs> and my question for Yi Qing is, um, how do you deal with the concept about Bu Art? Since Bu Art, it seems like a crucial concept in your study, but how do you, for example, how do you translate Bu Art into Chinese? I ask this question because in your archive, I found for example, first of all, you mentioned Cai Yuanpei and our, move, our movement society. But as I know, this group of people, they translate art into Chinese as Mei, or si Mei Shu, or si Mei Yu. But in, in, the last, in your last slide, you just apply two image. One is a Greek art sculpture, and another one is a front page of the magazine. And the front page magazine, it print a line, uh, in Chinese, 何为艺术? It means what is art. So my question is, in your study, it seems that art, fine art, bu art, you didn't make a very clear distinction. So I'm very curious about uh, how do you deal in this kind of an issue? And as you know, uh, how do those people in, uh, in early 20th century, those scholars, how do they deal in this kind of issue? For example, how to translate Bu'ar? And my question for ruling is, uh, 
I really, I really uh, enjoy your talking, but I'm very curious about can, um, how do the artists select those people uh, to setting to state for his photograph? Because, um, for example, as we know, natural is not neutral in if we talk about contemporary art or contemporary photography. But in your artist, he appropriate a career format from literature art. And this kind of literature I usually don't seem nature is a political issue. So I just very curious about the identity of, of, of those people. For example, what is their job and how do your artists select those people? And that's all, thank you. Thank you for these great questions. Um, actually, uh, fine art, art, and uh, Beaux Arts. Um, I understand Beaux Arts of, or fine arts. It's more um, um, my understanding of these two concepts were influenced by um, the avant garde theories, uh, which articulate the fine art as individualist experiments. It's, it has an avant garde um, gesture of um, um, keep. A distance from the society, or keep a gesture of rebelling against the society. Um, so the the arts, uh, like you put forward, the He Wei Yi Shu. What is arts? So in this uh, this book is written by uh, uh, Lin Wenzheng, and in this book he not only talked about the fine arts or avant garde, he, he also talked about the European uh, tr uh, mm, classical art, uh, medieval art. So this, this, um, and in this book, in in several, in the first several pages, he put forward the fine arts, and also fine art arts, and this concept are very, in, uh, are very, um, um, are first in, in, appeared in China. And uh, widely used in 19 uh, since the 1910s, and there is a journal uh, named Mei Shu, means fine art. But they also talked about um, uh, something that is not uh, fine art. So in my dissertation, I would like to specify into the um, into the painting, the fine art. I love what you said, that natural is not neutral. That's like perfect logo for something. I, I love it. And I think you're totally right. And I think um, it raises a really interesting question of what is even possible in depicting a natural landscape now in an urban setting, um, especially so just because you're outside in a city choking with smog and millions of people, are you in nature? And so I think that, um, the fact that he chooses these scenes where there are people gathering in what would, I think, fairly be considered natural environments, even though it's a family picnicking under a, like a freeway overpass or um, all those people swimming with that portrait of Mao, um, that there's an expansiveness in the images and they're really open um, spatially. They always sort of suggest a greater swath of landscape and negative space. And so I am really inspired by Francois Julian's um, reading of uh, literati, like Chinese literati works, where he talks about neutrality as a, like a goal and virtue within the form that it allows an openness and a spaciousness for the interpretation. And so I, I think that is really helpful to think more about the relationship between naturalness and neutrality and where maybe the political can find itself in a landscape that's like so free of prescription. Thank you. Okay, I think uh, time is up. <laughs> Let's thank the, all the speakers. Yeah. <laughs> thank you.
thank you very much to our speakers, our faculty advisors, our moderators, and our audience for coming together today to help us uh, host and hold and celebrate our inaugural Getty Graduate Symposium. I hope to see you all back here next year for the second annual. But in the meantime, please join us outside for a reception to celebrate a, a productive day of really generative conversations. Thank you. Thank you.